Hello and welcome to a quick documentary of experiment I did during my time in undergrad. This experiment involved 20 different cultivars and accessions of soybean. We're using a specific test to figure out which ones are more resistant to white mold than others. The experiment was done in the following ways. First, a grower room was set up as very specific temperature and humidity, which was kept constant throughout the entire process. During this time, Free seeds of each accession, which is a broad term for different lineages of plants utilized as either cultivars or breeding material. There are 20 pots per rep, and each rep got free seeds. Following that, water containers and piping were added into it, which would gradually drip feed a mixture of water and nutrients into the soil to allow the plant to grow properly. During the exact same time, we began preparing other materials. One such material was preparing the inoculum mixture. We utilized a common white mold strain found within Ontario. First, we need to refresh the petri dish sample. The fungal pathogen becomes less infectious over time as it grows in the petri dish. We can refresh this potency by taking a small sample of the material, specifically the sclerotia, which are tiny little black fruiting bodies that grow on the mycelial culture, like little tiny ugly looking mushrooms. These get placed on fresh medium, which is commonly utilized in tissue culture, and placed within a specific growth chamber for about a week. This material will then be grown out and mixed with a sterilized potato broth based medium. The potato broth based medium is a mixture of a potato agar style broth which is then dissolved in deionized water and put into a special oven called an autoclave for several hours. Once the medium is sterilized and cooled down, both substances get mixed together and then shaken up to make it more homogeneous. A third level of homogeneity is achieved by using a blender to blend up this mixture. This becomes a primary medium utilized in the inoculation process. One of the issues that came up during the experiment after checking on these plants multiple times was that about 13 out of the 60 pots did not have any seedlings growing out of it. Three of which can be attributed to the fact that the water lines were not connected to the water source. The other 10 remain unknown, but regardless, the pots had to be reseeded. This contributed to further problems down the line for the experiment. Some speculation on what caused the trouble would be the fact that some of the seeds had impurities such as mold growing on it. Due to this being field harvested stock, this is unavoidable. How much contamination played a role in the problems with emergence remains unknown. Although I suspect that it played a larger role than expected. Another factor that may have played a big role in preventing seedling emergence would be general emergence problems. I asked one of the researchers I was working with for that course, but found that although all three reps of one particular cultivar failed to emerge, such issues were not found in previous forms of the experiment using the same cultivar, rendering that hypothesis moot. Regardless, there are several factors, at least one of which is fully known, that caused a great deal of trouble in terms of germination. The next round of seeding attempts was much better, as 6 seeds were used instead of 3. But even still, 2 out of the 13 pots that were reseeded failed to germinate and emerge. It was during that time I noticed that some seeds that were planted prior to this, specifically in the reseeded pots, had rotted from some sort of disease. This brings to light a possible contaminant within the seeds themselves. It is likely that going forward, seeds obtained through cleaner routes, such as indoor production, may be utilized for future endeavors. 
has one specific possibility, or general increase in mass CO2. Many of these plants were reaching the flowering stage, although it's uneven. The inoculated coughing pads, split in half, would then be placed on the second lowest flower on each node, although this was not always possible due to flower merchants being uneven across the entire plant, with some cultivars only having flowers on the top portion of the plant. This was further compounded by the simple reality that flower emergence was uneven due to the receding process and general cultivar differences. This, in combination with a short deadline to meet the end of the experiment, meant that unopened flowers also had to be used. This was less than optimal, but still thought still had to be done nonetheless. After inoculation, there are varying degrees of success, as can be seen on different accessions. Several plants have been fully wilted by the disease proper, some have just been inoculated, and amongst, uh, and amongst the specimens of which the infection was allowed to progress normally, there are varying degrees of results, with some specimens having entire parts of their broken down by the lesion. Still others only had partial lesions that spread only a few millimeters wide and long, and there's quite a few variations in between. This is likely due to the fact that, for one, there's uneven application of the protocol due to time constraints, and within those circumstances, complete infection could not happen. In still other cases, even in specimens that already had known levels of resistance to white mold, there are still specimens within different reps that had aggressively long lesions, and there are specimens of plants that were already known to be super susceptible to the disease, that had almost no lesion. The latter can be explained by uneven application of the protocol, as mentioned before, as the fungus probably could not get into the unopened flower as it was too early in the life cycle of the plant for it to become fully susceptible to the disease problem. In cases where the lesion became longer than expected, I would attribute this to the misting system used to progress the white mold infection. Although the misting system is very uniform, the water that is drawn from it is exposed to the air on top of the bend. Due to the high temperature of the grow room, extra humidity would be wicked out from that exposed water, creating a microclimate of high humidity in certain parts of the bench. Such situations can increase the growth rate of fungi. Since there's no purely resistant variations of soybean to white mold, with only partial resistance being the maximum, it is likely that with the added boost of extra humidity favoring the life cycle of the fungus, the fungus was given enough advantage to overwhelm the plant itself, even with the genetic resistance native to that soybean accession. As a result, there is a great many outliers formed in this research, as well as missing data. Utilizing the help of a professor and software, the data was normalized and the outliers were removed. And here are the results of the research. To conclude the video, I will show you the data that's obtained through the help of a professor and utilizing our software package and Minilab. The names of these cultivars and accessions used are proprietary for some of the strains. As such, only their entry numbers will be utilized for this part of the presentation. If you look closely at this image, you'll notice that some of these entry numbers have X's beside them. These are the control groups. Cultivar 158 is already known to be partially resistant to white mold. Cultivar 75 is known to be intermediary between partially resistant and susceptible, and Cultivar 187 is known to be incredibly susceptible. Now you're probably wondering what these layers mean. Well, each layer indicates that this entry is statistically similar to other cultivars that also have an A. If, for instance, you see 
two cultivars that have an A and nothing else. Even if the number is different, statistically speaking, you can't differentiate them from each other with the data you have in the system. An entry number with two letters beside it means that they're statistically identical to anything with both of those letters, and so on and so forth. As you can see, 187 is statistically identical to entry 4, entry 182, and entry 101. Entries number 116, 91, and 169 are statistically identical to each other, as well as entries 187, 182, and 101. And cultivars 182 and 101 are statistically identical to everything. So any data we can gather from 187, 182, 101, 116, 91, and 169 is suspect. So what conclusions can we make? Entry number 4 is the most susceptible variety on our list. And all the cultivars with only a C next to their number can be classified as either moderately resistant or partially resistant. There's insufficient data to differentiate between these two levels of resistance. Several of these cultivars are heirloom in nature, but most of them are modern varieties. Most of these varieties have other cultivars of that have known moderate or high levels of resistance within their pedigree, which may explain why these cultivars also have, which would also explain the durability of these cultivars. Such cultivars will be covered in a future video a year down the line, but for the time being, this concludes everything. Thank you for watching.